Welcome to Healing Solidarity and Bodying Change, the second conference about reimagining international development. I'm Marianne Clements, a feminist writer, facilitator, activist and coach, and I'm the initiator of Healing Solidarity. In this conversation, I'm talking with Shauna Wakefield about meaningfully integrating resilience practices in our work as a central component of how we can practice values of equity and challenge ourselves to really reflect on what it means to discern a role in working for solidarity in a global context that resists participating in perpetuating injustice. Sean is full of wisdom and insight on these topics and I hope that you'll enjoy listening to our conversation. So hi and welcome to Healing Solidarity and I'm here with Shauna Wakefield who's a facilitator and consultant on equity and transformation. Um, and Shauna, welcome. Do you want to just share a little bit about who you are um, and something about your work in the world? Sure. Um, I am now a freelance um, independent uh, person who works on um, gender justice issues and um, feminist leadership and primarily around um, transformative practice and process. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm a mom of two girls mm-hmm. and I live in Brooklyn, New York. And mm-hmm. I, my work spans between the U.S. and internationally now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Cool. Welcome. Thank you for sharing that. And I, I'm excited to have you on Healing Solidarity because we've talked a bit before and you shared a practice last year, but I would love to share with people a bit of your thinking around transformation and around how healing can play a part in transformation and in, in bringing more equity to our work, whether that's internationally or in other contexts. So you want to share a little bit about how you think about healing in the work? Um, what that means for you, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, there's so many words that are um, being used around this area of, right. um, you know, and I've, I've learned and been using many different ones myself over the last years around collective care, self-care, well-being, um, sustainability, resilience, um, healing. Yeah. And um, I think I just, you know, I was thinking about my own kind of trajectory in this in this work and coming from, um, you know, background and working a lot in international development for so many years, and um, and the sort of separation that that can happen between the kind of cognitive um, and and intellectual side of doing advocacy and supporting um, supporting development work, yeah, and the the real work that happens with individuals and communities when they're going through a development process, human development process, community development process, um, and how healing often needs to underlie that. And, and healing being, um, you know, any process whereby one becomes a more whole version of themselves, mm-hmm. uh, where uh, a trauma or conflict um, or any kind of harm that's done uh, kind of takes away, can take away from, from our, our full selves. Mm-hmm. And so healing to me is really about kind of coming back to some sense of, of what that means to, to live life a bit more wholly, to be more present, you know, to be able to be in community with others in a way that is, dig- you know, has dignity, mm-hmm. um, to it. And so I don't necessarily, healing is, um, you know, it's a, it's a really important word. And, um, and I think more about resilience, I think Mm -hmm. these days. Um, and you know, I think it also has, um, resilience can have a a loaded meaning to it as well. All these words can have loaded meanings and they can get overused and people can get part of them and they can be appropriated in all kinds of ways. Um, and sort of take away from people's individual you know, perceptions of what that means for them. Um, but to me, um, I'm feeling, you know, sort of resilience and resilience practices that, that really help us to come back to, um, you know, some sense of, of being centered, some, some sense of I can be with others mm-hmm. and um, organize with others, support others, and, and kind of get my needs met as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Cool, yeah. It's yeah. a healing process, and that's a process too. Yeah. 
but these are like words that I'm words that I'm thinking about and how do we support them happening you know there yeah right right and so then um I'm interested in sort of how you're how you're thinking about resilience practices because I know like you know then the same with healing practices when people use that term it can mean a lot of different things to different people and I think resilience too so I'd love to hear a bit about the kinds of practices that you've been exploring in your work because I know you've done quite a lot of thinking about how 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 to bring these practices into work in both in movements in the U.S. and in in, in development kind of settings as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I'm definitely a student. You know, I'm a student of many many things, and um, I've I've learned that being an adult learner is is kind of a really awesome thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, you sort of learn things and and international development has a lot of experts in it, you know, and I think many fields have a lot of experts. And um, I think there's something really wonderful about being a learner. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Over, I've been a yoga practitioner for 20 some years. Um, I began really being a dedicated practitioner of meditation um, uh, 10 years ago and I've had a daily practice of, of sitting and, um, and mindfulness. And, um, and then more, more recently I've been studying somatics through generative somatics. Um, and, you know, sort of those are my three, I guess, main, you know, practice bodies in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, like many of us, I would say those, those were sort of self, not somatics, but the other, other two sort of started as self oriented practices, the meditation and the yoga. Um, I began practicing yoga really as a, as a method of survival in a way, um, when I worked with Oxfam in Cambodia and, um, and just had a lot of stress and, uh, insomnia and just a lot of activation of my, of my brain and, um, digestive system and and stuff and just wasn't settled really. And I could, I couldn't sleep. So I got up every morning at like 4.30 and just made the most of it with practicing yoga. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And over time, I was like, wow, this is very, this is very separate. And how do we really, how can I bring this into the work in a way that doesn't just, you know, like so many of us say this, we don't just like leave ourselves at the door and we go do our, our self-care thing. And then we come back in, um, just to get, you know, battered again or to be, uh, you know, to get back into situations of stress, but how do you use that to kind of transform that experience? And so I just was in that question for a long time and I'm still in that question right. um, in terms of how do we make more of a, um, more of a connection and more of a, more of an interdependence between how we care for ourselves individually, how we care for our, you know, our family sphere, our community sphere, and the connection to, to work, especially when the work is not necessarily in our direct community. Mm-hmm. You know, how do we, how do we create that, that sense of um, well-being and care through practice mm-hmm. in a way that, you know, it, sometimes it may be the similar practices that you do on your own. So, you know, I do bring in, in my facilitation work and more and more, I bring in my yoga. So I got certified as a yoga teacher five years ago, um, really with the primary intent of, um, I mean, one is I turned 40 and I was like, I'm going to stop asking this question about whether or not to do a yoga teacher training and I'm just going to do it because it's a birthday present right. to myself. And how can I use this in my work in a, in a way that's validated and is seen as part of the process of um, development our teams of trusting each other of being in um being in solidarity with others you know because when we're in our bodies we're much more able to listen you know? we're much more able to perceive we're much more able to feel we're much more able to communicate what what really matters and not only what we've you know ordained through our intellectual processes and reading of documents and mm-hmm. um you know even just listening to what people are saying Sometimes we don't even really, you know, process what's going on because we're not really paying attention. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I bring in, um, you know, I bring in yoga. I bring in a little bit of movement in my facilitation now. Um, often, you know, we'll do some kind of mindfulness practice, meditation, journaling, 
with folks, um, a little bit of, you know, baby somatics, sort of just uh, very basic centering exercises, very basic, um, getting people, you know, to feel into their bodies in some kind of way. And the experiment of it is really how to make it not a um, escape from what's happening in the room, but really to use it to help unlock, you know, we, we have in some of the work that I do, there's tough conversations about power that need to happen. And people will say, oh, we need, you know, we need to talk about power. That's a feminine. I work with a lot of feminist organizations. Um, we want to talk about power, but then when you really get into it, it's tough. You know, it, it hurts actually. Yeah. It genuinely hurts people. I think when there's not an alignment between what we want to say, how we want to be in the world, what we're, what change we're trying to create or catalyze and how we're behaving with each other. And so I a lot of hurt, you know, and getting to that question of healing. I think that's something that needs to heal in people too, is, is like the times I didn't show up well for my colleagues, times that others kind of abused their power and I felt it, yeah. you know, and the lack of trust there. Yes. I'm just trying to bring in and learning different practices and ways of um, sort of systematizing, you know, um, at work. So yeah, primarily through facilitation, you know, we all do tools. And so um, you know, I worked with uh, Gender at Work last year. We did some um, kind of toolkit for International Women's Development Agency around feminist organizational strengthening. Mm -hmm. uh, and I did a couple there around self-care and, and collective care. So facilitation processes and practices together um, and, and around um, feminist leadership and accountability. Um, incorporating always some aspect of, of care and embodiment and, 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 you know, as I said, accountability to that. So what is it that you, what is it that you want to practice? We're always like, you know, we're always practicing something. There's many things we do over and over again. So consciously, what are we doing that matches our, our values and principle? So I'm really interested in helping groups to define what that looks like and what those, you know, what those practices look like for their group, you know? That, that help them to materialize what they are trying to cultivate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, just to take you back a bit to the somatics and that aspect, it'd be interesting just to share, if you could share a little bit about what that is for people that might, I think people know a, a bit about mindfulness and yoga generally, but maybe somatics not so much. I think it'd be interesting for people to understand a little bit about how that might be brought into facilitation or, or kind of work a so-called work context. <laughs> I don't really want to make that separation so much, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'm really new on this particular path. I mean, somatics is, is, is basically a you know, kind of mind, body, spirit, technology, a way to integrate and a way to um, a kind of set of methodologies about how you can feel more and be, a, be with those feelings, be yeah. with those you know, emotional feelings, those physical sensations. Um, and so, you know, yoga has that in it, you know, it's as a body-based practice. Also many, many dancing, you know, as a somatic, yeah. there's many, many somatic practices. Um, I've started studying with uh, generative somatics, which really centers the relational piece. Yeah. Yeah. Posits kind of that you can't heal alone, that healing is a process that happens in relationship with others. Mm -hmm. um, and there's lots of folks who, you know, explain, I think, generative somatics and their philosophy and how they do it really well. You know, people who have been studying and practicing for many, many years. Um, my my um, coach, Sumitra Rajkumar, has a, um, well, both of there's a couple episodes on the Healing Justice podcast. Mm -hmm that kind of describe it. There's a couple articles, you know, that she's written that break it down a bit more, which I, I share with people. Um, right, we can share a link. Sure. I'm, a, I'm a student and a practitioner and, and really a lot of it is around, you know, you, have, you kind of have to do your own process before you bring it into groups. Right. And, and so that's what, that's kind of where I'm at in my process is more, as, more of a learner, mm -hmm. you know, than then um, bringing it as a primary facilitation, you know, tool. 
because it is about, you know, there's a whole sort of transformational arc that you, that you kind of go through. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess the other thing to say about it, which I think is just generally um, great is that you have a commitment. And so that's something I think that can be lacking in other practice areas where you don't, you know, you, you don't necessarily articulate, what am I about? What am I here for? Yeah. Um, and what does transformation actually look like for me and my group, mm-hmm. my people? And so that's one thing that I've really benefited from, I think, is sort of articulating that, yeah. you know? So it's really intentional. You know, you provide pressure to each other. You provide, you know, opportunities to say yes, to mm-hmm. say no, mm-hmm. to say mm-hmm. ally you know, with, and it's all through the body. Yeah. 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 And so I think that's really interesting to think about how we can um, bring that piece of feeling and embodiment, but into work for change in a meaningful way, rather than it being, as I think sometimes it feels like, like a kind of thing that we're in at the beginning or end of something, but doesn't really feel like a part of it. And I think, um, I, to, to me, I see you as someone who's really thinking about that and kind of, you know, definitely in the learning. And I hear that, but also has some ideas and has also seen um, a bit of, of how we could be practicing things a bit differently in our work. So I'd love to hear um, a bit about how you see the connections between these practices that you might bring and the kind of work for justice and equity. I think you spoke about equity in the beginning but how do they intersect and I, I guess in generative thematics but also in it more widely how, how could how might we think about them intersecting in a way that's really supportive mm-hmm. yeah um I mean I I think that I think to some extent it's a challenge because mm-hmm. um I mean, there's many reasons. A couple that are coming up for me right now is that there is so much, um, there is so much trauma and pain mm-hmm. in many of the groups that we're working with. You know, I, whether I'm here and you know working in the states um, with groups or or overseas, like my you know my work is on gender justice, women's rights. Um, I'm working increasingly around diversity, equity, and inclusion. So work race and other forms of oppression Mm -hmm. and there's so much um there's so much that people don't process you know in their own kind of lives in their own spheres um because it's actively you know there's an active (laughs) process of marginalization oppression or abuse that's happening Mm -hmm. um or it's in the past and it hasn't been um processed in a kind of supportive way people bring that into groups and in one way, there's, there's no way that people want to deal with that, you know, because it's not like fun. It's mm-hmm. not, um, there's an idea that we can just kind of get on with it. Yeah. You know, that the, the problems that we're working with are not about ourselves. They're about someone else, you know, yeah. someone else issues. Um, and, and that there's, there's no, like, there's not a lot of support for this work right now. I mean, I think it's coming. Mm-hmm. I, I think that there's more attention being placed around um, around healing, around healing justice, around well-being, collective care. All these things are are getting more and more visible, and there is support coming. But the way that you know, the way that development is set up, and the way that donor um, priorities are set up, are not around sort of transformational processes, really. And so that you know, that's a those are preventative aspects that make it challenging. Um, and yet, you know, more and more I see folks that, that are realizing, well, we can't really do this work. They may not be down with like particular practices that we're talking about, yeah. but they understand that relationships are broken, that solidarity is broken, that trust has been broken yeah. and that old ways of doing things are not the, the old ways being the old ways within this current system. Yeah. Sort of, um, you know, you want to call it the nonprofit industrial complex or the NGO <laughs> industrial complex, sort of yeah. all of these, um, all of these ways that we've kind of commodified development. I mean, <laughs> a process that is not, a, not meant to be about, um, you know, that kind of capital, right? So, right, right. Absolutely. 
we've lost the relational piece and the piece that brings in why are you of value simply because you're human, because you're yeah. a living. Why is yeah. the environment valuable simply because it's it's here and we live with it, <laughs> you yeah. know, and not part of it. Um, yeah. 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 And so I guess, and I have seeing that too, like people kind of, I don't know if waking up is the right word, but realizing that, that the relational problems that we have, the challenges around like how funding is delivered and the pressure upwards and all these things, they're realizing that they feel unsustainable, right? And then um, yeah. I'm kind of interested in where, where the hope is. <laughs> and for me, it is in, you know, how do we build the relational? But in order to do that, it's like, we have to kind of take apart this whole idea of what we are and who we are <laughs> in the work <laughs> to me. And I wonder what you think about that. Maybe I, maybe I over egg what the, the, the kind of breakdown that needs to happen, but it feels like, you know, we have to kind of reimagine who we are and what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think about that a lot in, in terms partly like, how do we, I, I think there is a taking apart, like there's an undoing, you know, there's an undoing to practice, like what we're mm -hmm. practicing. We have to kind of stop doing some things that are harmful. Yeah. Ourselves and others yeah. to be better, you know, better in community. Yeah. And, and um, so there's an untangling and a, you know, undoing harmful habits. And I know many, I'm thinking of Jessica Horn, I think she talks about this and others right, talk yeah. about what you need to undo. Yeah. So you can start to, to um, have a healthier set of practices. And, you know, I think what I think about is how do we do that where we're not necessarily having a breakdown? <laughs> where we're not, I mean, maybe that needs to happen. That can happen in all kinds of ways, but how do we kind of recognize some of the shifts that need to happen and like move towards mm -hmm. something that we move towards a way of being or relating or a change that we desire. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, you having breakdowns along the way and any transformative process, there has to be some kind of crumbling or dissolving or, you know, right. letting go or, you know, um, but how do we do that kind of in a way that we can prepare ourselves a little bit better before we have the big breakdowns <laughs> right, all, right. all the folks that I know that are in in these questions have had some kind of like you know stress breakdown health breakdown um you know mental physical emotional um and then that comes to some kind of a relational head whether it's at work or in you know love life or <laughs> yep. as parents you know it has some kind of um big bang effect that um, maybe if we had been in practice of some kind intentionally and knew what we were moving towards, um, not that that wouldn't happen, but that it could happen with more um, kind of more, more rigor and more attention and intention to what's actually happening. Cause we get so distracted and think that what's wrong is not what's really wrong sometimes, you know, or it's yeah. other fault. You know? fault or, yeah. <laughs> Um, you know our own responsibility around that yeah and, and that's what I think you know the, the whole what what jazz talks about for instance with power over and others power yeah. over power power um, with power to all of that that's where I think you get in a process of um, using power harmfully you know when you don't do some of the work yeah, yeah breakdowns happen and then it's always someone else's fault <laughs> it's always some other fault as opposed to oh wait where's the solidarity in this where do I find common ground in like my humanity your humanity and some kind of process where there's an acceptance that something went wrong <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. happening but what are we moving towards you know yeah, yeah and what I think it's really interesting in in what you just said is there's this piece of the individual, whether it's healing or building resilience or probably both, like for most of us. And then there's a, the piece of doing that in a collective way that I feel like feels quite alien to the development sector as I know it. The idea that we could do things in community that we might be 
moving towards something together. And also that we, if we're building solidarity rather than trying to kind of, in that, that old sense of development, fix some problems out there, then, we, then there's something about us and our community that really matters, right? And uh, yeah. And I, I mean, I think it can get really big. Like I look at some of the, um, I did a paper, um, which, you know, a paper on transformative and feminist leadership for women's rights yes. um, for Oxfam a couple of years ago. And um, I was so excited to be able to do this because it was about really creating some visibility for groups that I had admired, you know, so mm -hmm. much the work. Mm -hmm. Um, and and sort of getting to think about like how are you doing modeling feminist principles? How are you enabling, you know, others to to act and to be empowered? And how are you dismantling patriarchy, you know, in your everyday work? And um, I mean, I just think it can get really it can seem really lofty and complicated. And I was right. just you know thinking about um, you know pieces that I and others have written where where you 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 want to uphold the wonderful work that's happening partly because there's so much yeah. horrible <laughs> yeah. in the world that we're working in you know and then the reproduction that we do so to be able to hold up good good examples of good practice where people are proud of it and they never get to talk about it mm -hmm. you know, i had so many people say we never get to talk about the work that we're doing that is changing us and that is you know being really helpful yeah um, and it's like really small things sometimes, you, you know, you put them all together and it looks like, holy, you know, how, how would we ever make our organization a feminist space? How would we ever make it a space? But it's the little practices that really make, you know, make people, make people's hearts sing together. Yeah, right, right. Um, yeah. And I, I, it was just, I was reminded of being at Oxfam and, um, you know, being in a mainstream organization where women's rights and gender justice and, and equity issues aren't necessarily the main focus, even if, you know, it's an organization that puts women's rights at the heart of all we do, mm -hmm. day to day that didn't necessarily feel like that when, you, when, you, when you're really um, passionate about these issues, you know, it doesn't feel like it's always, the attention is always there. We found a group, you know, we found folks that, that believed in the same things, that were really curious about the same things, and that wanted to visibilize um, some really great work that wasn't necessarily being seen because it wasn't, it didn't look like some of the flashy, you know, policy wins or, you know, big mainstream economic, you know, um, trends. It didn't look like, it's like the under, <laughs> the work that was under a lot of that and holding all of that up. And, um, and we, you know, we created groups where we could talk to each other and trust each other and, and, and move things, you know, move things in the organization in a kind of way. Um, but that was based on the fact that, okay, we're, we're all feminists you know, here. We, we have some line of, of values and principles, you know, that we're going to move with and we didn't always do them well. Um, but there was some kind of baseline, I think, in terms of like, what are the ethics that we have here? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think that's like the key to so much of this work yeah. is having that, okay, what do we really believe in? And if we can work with that and forgive each other when we mess up, that's the part that we don't do <laughs> often. Yeah. And ourselves, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 Needs to create some kind of a north star, you know, creates a north star or a, you know something that we can orient ourselves around when things don't work out. Yeah, yeah, and it's interesting because I think sometimes when I enter into conversations with organisations that haven't really thought about practices of well-being, resilience, healing as integral to their work, it there's that sense of it being kind of like um something that you can add on to your work that isn't related to that kind of values and that North Star piece at all. And yeah, it always feels to me like it's only when you do that that it feels like it can really have an impact across an, an organizational space or when you join up the kind of value with the practice, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so the question that arose for me when you were talking about the feminist leadership um, paper was um, it, now that you're doing quite a lot of work around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, how is that that kind of 
I don't know if you whether you think of it about it as anti-racist or decolonizing or, or what, what what language you might use around it or not use around it. But I'm I'm wondering how that kind of shows up in terms of what uh, of asking questions about what would a, a space that that's equitable look like. I don't know in a similar way, perhaps. Yeah, um, you know, in the international space, I have to say that. Um, I almost feel like it's like I'm going back in time because <laughs> yeah. from a context where it's, it's about race, you know, I mean, this country, I'm American. So yeah. I'm just, this, and I'm half black and I'm half white. Yeah. And this, this country, I mean, we've been talking about race for <laughs> forever, but the harm is just there. It's, yeah. it's like so in everything. And you just, you know, you see it more and more out there, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because, you know, police keep killing black people yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. for driving fast. And it's just like the, the outrage is more palpable. I, I think because more people are more aware of it yeah. more white people are more aware of it. Yeah. Um, and the, the conversations about race here are just much more, much more, um, um, they're specific to this context. I guess that's what the thing is, you know? And so doing, doing work around, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, in, and I'm primarily, I'm working with foundations right now on this, this area. Um, I found challenging partly because, you know, race is a social construct. Yeah. So there's like a resistance to almost even talking about race. Yeah. Um, in some of, in some of these contexts, which I find kind of perplexing, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, fascinating and perplexing and I'm like how do we get past this um because it's a reality I mean number one a lot of these organizations are run by rich white men or women mm -hmm. and they're international you know or global and so you yeah. can't say that those constructs of race are not happening inside of these organizations yeah, so implicit <laughs> in the whole structure from the web yeah. guy, right <laughs> And it's partly, I think, a denial and a lack of, um, you know, it's like you have to go, again, back to the, the personal and the political. You have to look at your power and privilege in all of these positions, yeah. you know, in international development, in, in the work that I do, where I show up in, you know, certainly in foundations and philanthropy, where there's just so much money, resources that are being applied to communities through these frameworks that, you know, they may they don't necessarily account for people's own agency. You know, even those lenses, of, even our intersectional lenses sometimes look at only oppression, only marginalization, and don't look at what's there already that's helped help people get by, you know, and to thrive in different kinds of ways for, you know, thousands of years or hundreds of years, yeah. you know, for different communities. So I'm finding it really interesting to make this, to, to start doing more work around a, you know, kind of intersection of race and gender and class and different aspects um, internationally because partly because I'm American and so I come with an understanding that's, con you know, from my context that doesn't apply in other places. And so I have to be honest about, okay, whoa, my brain is working in a, in a way that is, you know, has been Americanized and has an American view of what whiteness means and looks like. Um, so I found it really interesting, you know, and I'm doing it very, very humbly <laughs> in, a, in a lot of ways. And I think it's super important, especially, you know, as I said, with this context where until international development really gets transformed and changed and maybe dissolves, as we say, you know, yeah. to transform what does it take actually for international development to be truly relevant and, and to, to, to really be in solidarity with people and, and serve a right role. Yeah. Um, that you know that may involve some dissolving or dismantling, as we're, as we're, you know we see in some cases, yeah. um, and confrontation of the the way that yeah race is, is constructed and so much all these aspects of identity really are socially constructed and we can reclaim them for ourselves yeah. and our communities and yet there's this other reality that you know it's not usually Africans running international development agencies for instance. Yeah. No. Yeah. There's some confrontation that needs to happen there. 
yeah yeah and it, f- it feels to me like it like that feels like such an essential piece to me now that it feels like without people really interrogating that question which is going to mean mean some some process right <laughs> it can't be solved with a log frame you know <laughs> I did some training tick you know <laughs> people are brains you know work with really smart people like all the time I feel yeah. like working with really smart people and you know often very educated people yeah and um and people are not always comfortable like breathing consciously yeah obviously they're breathing to be in a room and to you know share ideas and everything but to be with their breath or to feel um where constriction is in their bodies Um, or to feel if what they're saying, if what they're saying is coming from a heart space or a head space, you know, that they're not like some folks are not really comfortable with that. Yeah. And that's also where I think just kind of bringing it in sometimes doesn't, you know, I've, I've learned some lessons too about trying to make people, you know, breathe, like (laughs) move, (laughs) move their bodies. And they're just like looking at me like this is (laughs) <laughs> like really, you know, and then maybe some laughter can happen, and that's you know helpful, but um it causes you to think like, okay, really moving with people where they're at and moving with people when they're ready, all these things, yeah, you know that we learn through I learned as a gender specialist, you know and, and a gender expert, and I'm learning you know and as I do more embodiment work what that what does that look like, and what does that actually mean and of course we have to get uncomfortable, but when is that generative and when does that just shut people down? Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. And the, the thing that it makes me think about one and another thing that I learned in, in the work over the years is this thing of, you know, change takes time and sometimes it rolls backwards for a bit. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, there's, there's like, there's just a process, <laughs> I guess. Of, of of something but it feels to me like the work that you're doing around this is really valuable and and it's kind of what I feel is really really important for our sex to start grappling with and um yeah there's that there, it's, it's only just really coming into people's awareness now that there's there's some something to do around how we are in the work how we relate to each other in the work that's not about you know solving it logically and and so I really want to thank you for your work and um yeah (laughs) and um we'll link to some of the stuff you've mentioned as well so people can go find your articles and and which as you said uplift lots of other interesting work some of which was featured in the conference last year but there's lots of other things too um I I, I'm going to bring us to a close but is there anything else you feel is here <laughs> to share right now. Um, no, I mean, I'm just excited to keep experimenting with folks. And, um, you know, I, I didn't mention one of the folks that I um, interviewed in that paper mm-hmm. a couple of ago that I've been really riffing and, and imagining with, um, Kristen Zimmerman. Yeah. And we're, uh, we're kind of, we've been riffing off of Jazz and Shireen, who you've had here and, yeah. and folks. Um, about, you know, what, what does it take to have a community of folks who are in this question of, um, you know, what practices help us to bring our values to life, to bring our feminist purpose to life, to bring our social justice purpose to life? Um, and how can we do that through embodiment? And so we're, we're um, in the spring hoping to have a kind of mini intensive experiment around that. Cool. So stay tuned. We'll write, we'll write about it and we'll We'll talk about it once that is underway, but that's, that's kind of moving into that space of like a deep dive around this, these questions with folks who are kind of in it, um, especially young folks, especially queer folks, um, people of color around the world. Um, also because, you know, as an American who's living in this context here of, you know, authoritarianism, of destruction, uh, you know, that, that our, our government is doing is um, how can we learn from other folks 
and be in solidarity in a way that's really about exchange and interdependence rather than um, God, you know, like we, we know more because we come from this quote unquote developed place. Well, the world knows that's not true. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> they know now. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So, so that's kind of where I'm headed and, and thanks for having this conversation and for having the, the insight, you know, to bring so many different kinds of folks together for these conversations in the last one and, and presumably for this round. Mm-hmm. It's here. Thanks, Donna. I'm going to be watching what you're, you and Kirsten are doing as well and looking forward to hearing more about it. And thanks so much for being here. You've been listening to me, Marian Kernan, in conversation with Shauna Wakefield. And this is Healing Solidarity Embodying Change, the second conference about reimagining international development. Thanks so much for joining us for this conversation today. If you'd like to spend a bit more time with the suggestions and ideas we discussed in this talk or in any of the others in this conference, Don't forget you can make a contribution to support the production of the conference and get access to recordings and resources to help you go deeper with these themes and ideas. Just click the link below this video to find out more.